Thanks for attending this uh, new session around uh, machine translation. So this afternoon, we are going to talk about best practices for adapting neural machine translation models. Can I ask who was there this morning? Just, yeah, OK, yeah. So this morning, we actually installed uh, Edge, which is the machine translation on-premise solution from SDR. Um, and you know, it took 30 minutes to install basically two uh, different systems, uh, which are actually including the on-premise neural trainer, which we use to adapt a neural machine translation model. Uh, my name is Arnaud Simon. I'm a product manager for machine translation. Um, today, I'm with Quinn Lam, uh, who is my colleague in product management. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll be happy to have this session with you. Let's keep it interactive. I will try to do as many demos as I can. Uh, like we did this morning, although there might be a little bit more slides on this one uh, as we go through the best practices. But uh, we'll again try to do as, as much demo as we can. So we'll go over you know, the uh, adaptable LPs that we released this year, uh, and also uh, the Edge on-premise trainer. And then we'll cover best practices. I will actually do the demonstration uh, in between, so you know there is no death by PowerPoint uh, after lunch. So we introduced this year a new way to adapt machine translation. And we know that adapting machine translation is actually key for enterprises. Generic models are great but to deal with like, most of generic content. But when you have your own very specific content, it's actually critical to be able to adapt it and adjust it so that machine translation gets better at translating your content. So, so far at SDL, we have um, more than 120 generic language pairs. So it's like um, language combinations translating from one language to another. Um, and these basically include like foundational data, it includes all the generic information that we use to create these generic models. What we released this year is adaptable language pairs. So it's a, a language pair that you can actually adapt and train with data to make them better at translating your content. It's fully integrated in the Edge on-premise solution. So as you will see, you know, there will be no surprise from this morning. It's basically the same interface that we use. And we made it as simple to use as you know, the installation or the quick translate or all the existing features that exist today in Machine Translation Edge. Uh, so very easy to uh, install, to use, and to deploy. And this is what we are going to uh, achieve this afternoon. And it's secure to the core. You know, you basically use your own data to train your models. You do it on premise. There is no need to share your data with anyone else. No need to send it somewhere. So it gets processed. Um, it's really uh, secure by design. So you will train on premise, but the models that are created on premise can actually be used either on premise or in cloud. So there is a full flexibility of uh, using the models that are created with the trainer. So let's start with a demonstration. Like this morning, I have a lot of screenshots, but you know I always enjoy um, live demos rather than screenshots. But at least you'll have screenshots in the in the PPTs if you get them. Um, so let's actually switch to. Let me actually exit the sorry exit the presentation so we can share the same screen. OK, again, for those who attended this morning, you should be quite familiar with this user interface. This is the machine translation hedge user interface uh, that, we, uh, that we basically used this morning. Um, so this is a quick translate. This is where you copy paste text or upload documents to get them uh, translated. Right? So at the moment, I have one language pair which is active on this uh, setup. This is the German to English. And as you can see, the model that I'm currently using is generic uh, model. So it's basically the baseline that we provide uh, when uh, we sell language pairs. If I type some text in there, so you know, very standard uh, text, it gets translated automatically to English. Okay, this is great, my, but it's like quite generic sample. 
when it starts to get challenging is when you actually use very specific uh, text or content that you want to translate. So let me give you an example. I'll give you an example with this uh, sentence, which is basically uh, pharmaceutical uh, content. So again, get translated uh, immediately. We'll review it. But as you can see, this specific word, film tabletten, is translated by tablets. Okay, so remember this. Now I will try with another segment, which is more related to automotive. So let's copy paste this segment. And now this, and excuse the accent, this Steuergerät is translated as computer, right? With the generic. Uh, language pair. Great. So if we now, let me, can you still see the screen? Yes. So these are the results that we get from the generic engine. Let me switch to presentation mode. OK. So this is the sentence that I used to translate. I translated with the generic machine translation. And this is how a human translator would translate it. So as you can see, it's already different. And especially if you just notice the tablets, which was a translation of film tabletten, uh, would actually be translated by a human translator as film-coated tablets. If we look now at the automotive sample that I used, um, this is the translation we got from the generic engine. And this is our human translator will translate it. So it's not a computer actually, but it would be a you know, control unit. This is how it's basically uh, called in the automotive industry. So this is great. How do I get there? How do I train or adjust, adapt my models to reach this kind of uh, quality versus the generic one? And this is where adaptable language pairs have been made for. So as you can see on my uh, edge, I have here something called adapted LPs. This is where I will be able to go and create new models. So let's go there. So as you can see, I have a couple of models that exist already. I just want to show you how you create one. It takes a couple of hours to generate a model. So you know we'll start it during this session, but it will not finish before the session ends. But as I have prepared a couple, of them, we'll be able to test them and evaluate them. So what do you need to adapt a model? You need data. Okay, so when you have data in the form of a translation memory, you can use it and add it to the model. And the hedge trainer will actually retrain the neural network using this new data. It will use the baseline as a generic, uh, uh, as the generic engine, and then will augment it with the data that you provide to the engine to create a new model. So let's click on new. Uh, so it's, again, very easy. We'll call it you know, pharma uh, long, um, model. At the moment, I, have, I can choose you know, which baseline I want to use. So I can either choose the generic as baseline, as baseline. But since I already trained an adapted automotive one, I could use this as a baseline. Here, it doesn't make sense. I will not adapt further my automotive one. I will just want to start from the generic one, and we'll create a new one. Then you will select on which host you want to do your training. If you remember this morning, we had this column where you can create training engines. So basically, it will display here the list of hedge hosts with a GPU that have a trainer engine enabled and started. And then all you need to do is to upload your data. So you need to provide your data in the form of a TMX file or multiple TMX files in a zip file uh, that will be used for training. So you know, it's very easy. You go there, you select a file for training, and then you just click Open. You can also optionally provide test data. So this is optional, but it's very good to help you evaluate the quality of the created model versus the generic one. And we'll use blue score calculations. So just to give you an idea, 
Of course, it will not replace human evaluation, but at least it will give you an idea of how the generic performs versus the adapted that has been created. So you can provide here uh, 500 or 1,000 segments that will be used for evaluation. If you don't provide any test set, we will automatically extract a part of the training data set to create this test data set. And of course, if we extract it from the training data, we will not use it for training. Yeah, the, goal, the goal of this is really to use data that has not been used for training and to evaluate the quality of the new model. So if I don't do anything, it will extract 500 segments from uh, this data set. Then I can put a comment. And then just click Create. So what's happening next? It will take the TMX file, it will upload it, and it will start to process it. Then this will be uh, picked up by a trainer engine, and it will start doing the training. OK, so we'll see the progress uh, as we uh, go through this uh, uh, presentation today. And, uh, but it will not finish before the end of this session. Uh, fortunately, I have created a couple of these. So, I have, so once the training finish, you have the status ready to deploy. Ready to deploy means you have a custom model which has been created, and you can deploy it. And when it's deployed, the status, of course, is, is deployed. For each engine which has been trained, you can access the details. So let me try to do this. Yeah. So for example, for this uh, adapted model for life science, you can see on which training uh, host the training has been performed, when it started, how long it took. Uh, so we can see that this one actually was quite long, uh, took uh, something like five hours. Uh, and you can also see the blue score. So again, these were taken from uh, the data set for calculating blue score was extracted automatically from my training data set. With the generic engine, I have a blue score of 52. With the adapted model, I get 59. So it's an improvement of my blue score of 7, which is you know decent. Okay, same thing for uh, automotive. In this case, I even get you know, a better uh, difference. So I can expect that my language pair, my adapted model, will actually perform much better with my content compared to the baseline. And I can see also if this is deployed on which um, host of my uh, edge instance, this language pair is currently deployed. Once a language pair is ready to deploy, so it has finished its training, you can actually start to deploy it. So if I click here, I will see, and I can decide and select which host of my edge instance I want to deploy this new language pair. So let's do it. I will select this one and deploy. So what happens? It takes this totally new model that has been created. It will copy it to the host. And I will be able to create a translation engine with it. As simple as that. And because we have this deployment process, we can deploy it to the edge, so locally on premise. But we can also uh, deploy it uh, in the cloud. And the good thing with, with these adapted models is you know, they are encrypted, so you can't really reverse engineer it. It's a neural net, so it's like a set of numbers. There is nothing you can extract from it. You can't extract data from it. So you can actually now you know, send it to the cloud. There is no issue with that. No one will be able to retrieve uh, the data that was used for this, uh, for this training. So this might take a little bit of time. You know, there is each language pair which is adapted is around 2 gigs. Uh, so this is the file copy uh, duration. And once it's done, we'll be able to uh, create some translation engine for this. OK, so now it's deployed. Uh, you probably also noticed that for each model that I'm creating, for each adapted model, so it will start with in its name with adapted. This is added automatically, so you can distinguish from the generic models. Uh, then the name you put, and then the version of the language pair that was used to create this model. And in this column, you also see how many translation units were actually used to train this model. And if you click here, you can also get some more details, how many characters, how many words in the translation units in total, and what test data was actually automatically extracted. You can even download the training data that was used, 
but also the test data that was used. So this is interesting because you can take it and you can actually compare really the translation of the generic versus um, the created one. So you can actually evaluate it yourself, not relying fully on blue scores. Great. So now that I have these two deployed, I can go back to manage deployment, the same you know, place we went this morning. Great. So I can see that I have my job engine. I have my trainer uh, engine, which is running on this machine, which has a GPU. And I have my German uh, to English. And I can see now that I have two language pairs available. I have the German to English adapted automotive and the German to English adapted life science. So I can come here. And I will actually add new translation engines. And now I can select you know, the adapted models. So click here, click Add. You know, now I want to add my life science one. Click Add. Et voila. I have now two translation engines, which I can start. And once they are started, I will be able to use them in my quick translate interface. OK, so let's wait. Well, actually, it will, it will refresh itself. So as soon as they are available, my drop-down list here will um, adjust, and I will be able to uh, use them immediately to perform the training, to perform the translation. So let me make sure that I can copy some of these. OK, great. So I have, ah, it's the automotive, which is started. Let's wait. Actually, let's start with the automotive then. So you remember, we had this sentence translated with generic. There must be no computer installed in the vehicle. OK, if I now use my automotive one, I now get a different translation. No control unit must be installed in the vehicle. So this model has been trained specifically to be better at translating this content. And it's not just about the word. You know, it's not just this that, is, you know, that was computer unit. You can see also that the style is a little bit different. And we'll compare it uh, right after this one. Let's use this other sample that we used earlier. So let's move back to generic. Oops. One will be enough. So with generic and all like Motefield tablets with care, let's use now our adapted life science, which was trained with life science data. And now it's Motefield film coated tablets should be handled with caution. So you see the difference in style and also now the terms are much better and more aligned with this type of content. So if I go back to my slides and we make some comparison, uh, so this is this was the original one. This is the human one that was in the training data set, and this is the result of my automotive adapted uh, language pair. For the pharmaceuticals, so same thing. This is the result of, so again, and it's not exactly as the human translator has translated it, you know, but we are using basically uh, some of the style uh, that we get uh, from the translation memory, which is used for the language pair training. OK. Any question about this uh, this short demo? Yes. So you need you need uh, you need an adaptable language pair. So we sell either generic language pairs. When you buy one generic language pair, it comes with one processing unit, but the model you get is the generic one, and you can't adapt it. You can use dictionaries, so you can you know, create specific dictionaries with your terminology, but it's not training. right? If you want to do training, if you want to use an existing TM and train your language pair, you need to buy an adaptable language pair. And the adaptable language pair also comes with one processing unit, which means that 
with, and you may have noticed, when I create a translation engine, you know, each time I create one, it will add one PU from the pool of PU that are available. So PU is a processing unit. It's a virtual unit that allows a language pair to reach a throughput of 2,000 words per minute. If you want a translation engine to reach higher throughput, you can add, let's say, two PUs, so you can reach 4,000 words per minute. So the more throughput you need, the more basically virtual processing units you can add. But if you want also to have multiple translation engines running, each of them requires one PU. So with one adaptable language pairs, it comes with one PU, means that you can run one adapted model at a time. If you want to create two adapted models like we did, automotive and uh, pharmaceuticals or life science, you need to buy for the German to English. You need to buy the adaptable German to English. It comes with one PU already, but since you want to run two custom adapted language pairs, you need to buy an additional PU. Yes? Uh, sir, you already mentioned that. So what's the minimum requirement of the memory for adaptation? Yes, I will cover this in the best practices. So I have some details about the requirements. Quinn? For the license, you know, when you're, you show it under the entitlement, that will include Yes. Yes. So under entitlements, you see what my license is, is allowing me to do. So it allows me to have two language pairs, uh, basically French to English and German to English. Uh, both of them can be adapted. So in my license, these are set as adaptable. And I have currently three processing units assigned out of 50. So I have 47 processing units left that I can allocate to you know, any custom models that I'm creating or any generic language pairs that I want to use. Any other questions? Yes. Small question to that. So is this allocation sort of dynamic? I mean, if I want just to try to train a model, how it works? Yes. So, so it's like semi-dynamic. If, if I just want to create, let's say, a new translation engine, because I have processing units available from my pool, it will just take one. So I can do this. I can say, yeah, I want a second translation engine for automotive, for whatever it's reason. Oh, yes, you, you can also undeploy. So when you remove, so let's say I do this and I start it. So at this stage, it's allocated with one PU, but it's not used. Huh? The PU is not used. So if I start it, then it will use the PU. So the PU is not available for any other translation engine. So we'll see that it's now one over one PU that is used. And if I stop it again, it will release the processing units. So at this stage, because it's used, I can see that I have only 46 available processing units. Okay, if I just, let's say, stop and even delete this engine, then it's, it's, it's released. So it will refresh, and I will have now 47 processing units available. Yeah, we, I will call this. So let me move maybe to the best practices then. Any, any question about the, uh, the experience or the UI or, you know, simple enough? Cool. So let's, let's go back to slides then. And let's cover the requirements. Great. So let's cover best practices. Um, of course, this is obvious, but you know, when you want to adapt models, if you want to adapt language pairs, what's really important is the data. That's you know, everything that matters. It matters in terms of volume. You know, the more data you have, you know, the more impact you'll have on the uh, training. Quality of your TM matters. You know, if you have like dirty data, it will also have an impact on the language pair and potentially a negative impact. So it's important to have good quality translation memory in order to train these models. And it needs to be aligned with the type of content you want to translate. You know, so it will, the, the data that you will use to train and adapt your model need to be representative of the content that you will translate in the end. Okay. So with this in mind, let's go over some of the requirements. So first of all, you need a translation memory. This is the basic. If you want to train and adapt uh, your models, you need a translation memory. It needs to be segmented in sentence mode. It needs to be correctly aligned. 
and I discuss some of the tools to you know check this, and we expect TMX format. Okay, so translation memory exchange format. From a volume perspective, the minimum that we use to start a training is a thousand translation units. So basically, a thousand bilingual segments properly aligned to do the training. What we recommend, based on our evaluations and on the impact of the training, is at least 30,000 translation units. So that you know, it start to make a difference and start to make an impact on the uh, language pair training. The maximum that we support at the moment is 3 million translation units. Uh, we can go higher if needed. It's just that you know, 3 million offer a good you know, training duration uh, versus uh, the quality impact of adding even more data. So these are the requirements in terms of, of volumes. Uh, we have also edge, the component edge, as a limitation on the maximum file size that you can, yes, I will just finish this and then, um, on the maximum file size that you can uh, upload to the system, and it's 50 megs. Mm -hmm. But we support zip, so it can be a TMX file that is zipped to, you know, um, and we also support a zip with multiple TMX files uh, for one training, so the trainer will know how to adjust this. Yes. Yes. So, so this is three million in one batch. So if you have six million, you can ultimately do a first training with three million, and then another training on top of the adapted one with the three millions. But the effect of doing this. Uh, is not necessarily predictable. So it might be good, it might be OK, uh, but it's better eventually if you have really 6 million, you know, let's review these 6 million. Are they really all very good? And, and usually you can try to reach uh, this maximum of 3 million. You will see the difference between each because each one will output a different model. So you will have a first, let's say, first model that will further adapt. So in the end, you have like three models, the generic, the first one that was trained and the second one that was trained further. Yes, yeah, so, so in other words, <laughs> sorry, uh, so, sorry, Quinn. In other words, when, if you do this, make sure to isolate your test set before and not let the system do it automatically for you. So identify a test set that is not in any you know, of the translation units that you will use for both trainings so that you can actually evaluate the real blue score evolution from the generic to the first trained, and then you use exactly the same test data set to test uh, the second training. Right, so we don't do this kind of check, but that's actually a good recommendation. Um, currently, when we extract it, we you know we remove it from the test data set. But if there are like segments that are exactly identical, uh, the w this is not checked. Um, so it's doable, but not from the UI today. But basically, because it's like a new model, nothing would prevent us from you know, like recreating one as just a replica, a duplicate. But it's not supported in the UI today. And it won't be supported by the API either. This is something we would have to implement. Although if you use the same baseline twice, you end up with two models, two different models from the same baseline. You don't charge for no, 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 that's, that's the beauty of it. You, you are not charged for training. You are not charged for the volume you use for training. You buy an adaptable language pair. You can train it as many times as you want. You can create as many custom models as you want. The only constraint is if you want to run your, all your custom models in parallel, you need one PU for each. Great. So for the test, so these were the requirements for the training data, for the test data. Uh, so this is what we use to calculate the blue score. Um, the minimum is 500 translation units. So this is what we extract automatically. And what we recommend is usually maybe 1,000. And of course, this also must be representative of the domain and the content that you use in the training. You know, if you train with some data and test with some other data that is not relevant or not representative, doesn't make sense. Okay, and this is basically the automatic extraction. So this is like pure, you know, volume requirements. Um, what is important is to provide good quality translation memory. You know, the data should be as clean as possible. So there is a step which is called data cleaning, which is basically preparing 
the material that we would use for uh, training uh, before starting the uh, actual adaptation. And the goal is to optimize the training and to optimize the model quality. Huh? So it's technical cleaning only. It's not meant to you know, improve linguistic or improve the translation units themselves. It's really meant to make the translation memory better and more suited for the training. And there are a couple of steps. So let's review these steps. First, we have what we would call the critical steps, uh, things that you absolutely need to do before starting a training with your TM. Then we'll cover some general improvements that we highly recommend to do. And then there might be some other like specific improvements uh, that you can do on your TM, which can be like fully uh, translation memory dependent. And again, from an expectation point of view, these steps that we document uh, and that we use as best practices, it will not you know, make the data consistent. Again, it will have no impact on the linguistic aspect of it. So if you're using a TM with different styles, different tone, different like um, uh, content, you know, data cleaning will not change this. Um, it will not change the translations. And it will not increase the volume of data that you use. On the contrary, right? it will probably, most probably, reduce it. Great. So these are, you know, just to manage expectations. So let's go through these um, critical steps, the ones that are absolutely mandatory uh, if you want to perform a training with Edge. So first, UTF-8 encoding. This is uh, absolutely required. Uh, and the TMs must be in TMX format. And if they are not, you need to export them in the TMX format. The TM needs to include the correct and proper language tags. Okay. And to perform these checks, you can actually open them in you know, there are file editors that exist or TM editors that exist that you can use to make these checks. So UTF-8 and proper language tags. So if you open it you know, with any standard editor, usually a TM will look like this. Uh, so you have, at the top, you will see the encoding. So if it's not UTF-8, you will have to set it or to convert it to UTF-8. And then you need to verify that uh, the language codes are actually aligned and correct for uh, the training processing. In the Edge documentation, we list the language code that are supported by Edge, just to make sure that uh, they are aligned with this. And we also support the studio language code, uh, so in case you are using also Studio to, uh, yes. Yes. Yes, as long as we have the generic engine for it, yes. The baseline will be the generic engine. Adaptable LPs comes with a baseline generic engine. So if you have the language combination, you can train it. So currently not at SDL. All our language pairs do not pivot. They are, they are like direct combinations, which means that if you attend our session tomorrow, we'll introduce some language pair chaining. You will need to do basically two trainings of two different language pairs, even if they are chained. OK, so this is basically um, some critical steps to perform. Uh, another critical uh, step is to remove codes and placeholders in the TMX, because these will have a negative impact on the training. Uh, so remove TMX content market tags. So anything you know, which is between the corner brackets, like BPT, PT, things like this, make sure to remove this from uh, the TM. So an example, you know, this is a typical example with all of these uh, tags. And the idea is to convert this into this. So again, there are tools to do this, where you can you know, select, uh, replace, find and replace, remove all these tags with uh, empty. So these are the critical ones. You know, if you do this already, you will start to reach you know, good quality to start doing your training. Now we'll move to the general improvement steps. How are we with time? Are we good or? Uh, five minutes. Great. Uh, it's OK. We'll manage. Was there a question? Uh, or? Yeah. 
Right. So at the moment, there is no specific enforcement. What we would recommend is, you know, if it's like really, really large, you can eventually discard it after like 1,024, for example. But otherwise, there is no, uh, there is nothing automated in the system. We, what we do is we get rid of empty segments. So if it's empty, you know, on one way or another, so if it's misaligned, we will remove it. But there, at the moment, there is minimal like steps that are automated. We have plans to improve this. So this is why we recommend to do this manually. So let's go through the general improvement steps. Uh, so elimination of segments with the same source and target. If it's you know the same thing in the source and in the target, you should get rid of it. We, we don't remove it automatically. And you should remove also the misaligned segments. So these, we remove them automatically, but you know, already better to remove them. So you know, your uh, TM will uh, be a little bit shorter to process. Uh, and you can also try to uh, identify possible misalignments, basically by identifying segments that are like really different in size. Like if one is double the size of the other, I would say for standard European language, hmm, there might be uh, something wrong with this alignment. So fix or delete corrupted data. Again, this is a ki can be kind of manual process, but you know if you uh, check your data, you should also remove the new like codes or the tabs, you know, like the backslash R, backslash T, backslash N. These are things that are irrelevant for training. So these are things that you should actually remove from your translation memory. And if possible, try to harmonize punctuation. Uh, an example of uh, punctuation harmonization is the quotes. Sometimes are straight, sometimes are like curly. Uh, so same thing, you know, it will help the training if you have the same you know, uh, alignment on your punctuation. So you can also delete translation units uh, that are not including any relevant text or semantically relevant text, so numbers, symbols, like, you know, t translation units that are just including punctuations. You know, you can remove these ones. And also if you have translation units in languages that are different from the one that you are planning to uh, train can happen, you should also remove these. We will automatically discard them, but again, you know, it will help reduce the size of the TM. And then you might have some very specific steps. Um, so you can actually you know, exclude, decide to exclude some specific segments based on your own knowledge of what you want to uh, perform as a training. Uh, and you know, if it's available, if you have some TM metadata, this is something that you can actually use to filter the data you want to exclude. So for example, in the TM metadata, if you have the users that are actually creating the segments, you might want to exclude some content from one specific user because you know, maybe you know, his style is not you know, what you want to have for the training. And if you want to reduce further the size of the TM, it may actually be a good idea to remove this metadata before doing the training. So if you have you know, issues reaching these 50 megs, even when zipped, these are some uh, of the things that can help reducing the, the quality. The, not the quality, sorry, reducing the size of the uh, data that you will use for training. Great, I think I'm almost on time. So just as a reminder, data matters. You, know, you need the appropriate volume to do the training. Quality is key. So if you apply all these steps that are documented in the Edge documentation, and we can also provide these uh, best practices uh, in a, a PowerPoint or PDF format, and use data that is representative of the content that you plan to translate with uh, these custom adapting models. And in the end, you know, it's a training cycle, because the more data you have, the more training you can do. And because you're not limited in the number of trainings you can perform, you can really have a continuous adaptation cycle where you can actually grow and use your t always evolving TM data, use it to uh, clean it, train your engines, and continue to improve you know, uh, in a, a virtuous quality cycle. <laughs>